Hey everybody, Nick here, and today I got a review for you of this little guy. This is the Doug Ritter Hogue uh, RSK Mark I G2. Uh, first off, though, full disclosure, this guy was actually handed to me by Doug Ritter at the uh, gathering there. But ahead of time, I'd sent him my uh, full review disclaimer. It's the same thing you can see on the website, basically telling him I'm talking talk about the good, the great, the bad, the ugly. Might be a gem, might be a junk. Um, he still said it along. Um, but nonetheless, we have to assume that this is the very best quality controlled RSK Mark I uh, G2 ever. Um, and more specifically, we have to assume that uh, I'm doing my best not to let this affect the nature of my review. But nevertheless, thanks, Doug, for uh, sending this guy along for me to check out. Next thing, size comparison. This is not a small knife, particularly. Um, here it is against the uh, Spyderco PM2. Here it is against the Ontario Rat Number 2. So you can see here, yeah, not small. And in fact, relative to the PM2, the uh, size is uh, very similar in the handle, but the sharpened blade length is actually longer because the uh, the, the, the PM2 has this finger choil in there. Um, so do keep that part in mind. And then finally, here it is against the uh, Spydeco Delica. So you can see right here, yeah, not a small knife whatsoever. So there you go, there's that. Next thing, um, let's do a little bit of background here. Um, This is a knife, actually, when I posted this on Instagram at first, a couple of people were like, oh my God, are you reviewing a clone? No, not particularly. It is true. Actually, a knife that is very, very, very similar to this was made for many years by Benchmade for Doug Ritter. It was the Doug Ritter RSK Mark I. Um, but uh, apparently, the, the, according to Doug, in 2016, Benchmade said they were going to stop making that particular knife for Doug. Um, and at that point in time, uh, coincidentally, the uh, access lock, uh, which is this sort of locking mechanism using a sliding bar sort of thing, the patent on that expired. And so as a result, uh, not only did Doug have his design back, because they weren't going to make it anymore, um, but he also had the lock available. And so he actually brought the design over to Hogue. Um, and Hogue is a manufacturer that um, actually has been doing some really cool stuff in the knife game lately, although I think for a long time they mostly made accessories for firearms. But anyways, um, he brought the design over to Hogue, and they said, uh, yeah, let's let's do it. And considering that Doug Ritter is the, the guy who did that, and he's the guy who designed the original one, there aren't any, like, clone issues or anything like that. It's just a case of the artist taking a design to another company. Um, it's all above board. Right now, it is a KnifeWorks exclusive, so if you're looking for this at your local retailer, I don't believe you're going to be able to do so. Um, I don't know if that's going to change in the future, but that's where it is. And then finally, um, I will probably refer to this guy mistakenly as the axis lock. Of course, the axis lock is a trademark term from Benchmade Knife Company. This is the able lock. But, uh, you know, I, if I, uh, which I forget exactly what that means, but either way, it's it's able. Um, I'm going to try and say able lock, but I may slip because, well, yeah. Anyways, so if I do slip, what I just said is access lock because it's very easy to access this from either side. Anyways, there you go. Um, let's go on ahead and jump into the good, the great, the bad, and the ugly of this very interesting little lock right here. So on the good side, start with, it's made in the States. Um, yeah, that's right. This is made by Hogue, and Hogue is based in the U.S. Um, you know, I always like seeing manufacturing in my home country. I'm cheering for my home team, as I'm sure you are in your country. Um, it's a nice thing to see. Um, also, I got to say, I'm really happy to see Hogue using another designer, uh, working with other designers here. Uh, uh, most of Hogue's stuff is with Elishevitz, and he's a great designer. But honestly, I mean, well, let's be real here. Diversity is a strength, and so having more designers means a lineup that's going to be more interesting to more people. So I really hope that this is the start of many more collaborations from Hogue um, alongside the stuff that they're doing with uh, Elishevitz on a regular basis. So that, that's a beautiful thing. Next thing, um, this is a little detail, but one of the strength, uh, I'm sorry, one of the weaknesses of some of your conventional locks in this style is that the, stri uh, the springs that they're using, which tend, uh, tend to be shaped like an Omega, uh, can occasionally break. Um, this can be a problem. And actually, uh, Doug mentioned very explicitly on his site that uh, when Hogue started doing this, they used a different spring manufacturer that they're finding to have increased reliability. Mind you, this is all, you know, hearsay. None of these springs have broken for me, but I've also not been using this for years and years and years. In fact, I've been using it for weeks and weeks. And, you know, they, they should be fine. But still, the fact that they're thinking about improving spring durability in this kind of a lockup for the Able lock here is uh, absolutely a nice thing. Although it is exactly the same, roughly, uh, layout and uh, type of spring as used in other implementations of a similar lock. Yeah, see, I'm, I'm doing good at not using the term. Anyways, um, so that's a good thing. Next thing, the handles on these guys are great. This is a G10 handle. Um, although it may not look like it immediately, this is just flat out G10 here, and it has been milled in a beautiful way. What you can see here is you've got a sunburst coming off the pivot, and then you've got these little radiuses cut into it here, and those actually provide incredible
incredible texturing. The whole thing is very, very well textured. And it's not like grippy in the sense of it's going to eat your pocket. No. Um, it's beautifully smoothed off in such a way that this will stay in your hand absolutely 100% flawlessly. This is a good knife for the Vaseline factory with this kind of a grip pattern, as well as with this jimping up along the top here. But at the same time, it actually looks pretty damn good, and it's not going to eat your pockets alive. I love these handles very, very much. This is really well done, and I, I'm glad to see it. They also, by the way, have a version of this in Hunter Orange, if that's something you're interested in. But either way, it feels like a huge upgrade from the plastic handles that you got on the Mark, uh, the Mark 1 G1, uh, the, the, the original version done with Benchmade. This is a big step up. So the handles on this guy are great. Next thing, one advantage of the Able Lock, or any lock along those lines, See, yeah, I'm getting it. Um, is that it is fully ambidextrous. Um, it, it is ambidextrous in a couple of ways. I mean, to start with, you can access it from either side, which is nice. Um, it has thumb studs on both sides, um, as well as a clip that you can transfer to either side. And you can see that the, the scales here are tapped for the, 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 the clip holes on both sides. So it's really, really easy, actually, to just swap this guy over. If you are a lefty and you will have exactly the same experience with this knife as a right-handed person will, it'll just be that the logo's on the other side relative to the clip. Yeah, it, so it's a fully ambidextrous knife, and that's a great thing. About 10% of the population is thrilled about that. So that's good. Then um, next thing on the blade. The blade shape is great. I like this blade shape a lot, and I liked it in the Benchmade version. It has a good amount of flat right here. It's got some belly. It's got a nice tip on it. This is a, a really nice utilitarian blade shape. Um, it's got a uh, nice sharpening choil here down at the bottom that is actually covering the whole uh, the whole plunge. It is actually very thin at the edge, especially as you get further out here. This thins right out. Look at the tip of that. Let's see if I can zoom that in. Yeah, that's a quality thin tip on there. Um, and it is a 20 CV steel. Um, some of the earlier runs were M390. Uh, M390 and 20 CV are chemically damn near equivalent, and Hogue is promising that they're heat treating it nice and hard, although I'm not able to test that, obviously. I don't have the technology nor the skill set, but nevertheless, um, this is a very, very nice uh, blade here. Right? It's been great in all of my use, and it came super sharp. That's the next thing. I have to say, one thing I can say ab about Hogue knives above I feel like every other knife maker I've dealt with is that their knives come sharp as heck. Whoever's doing their sharpening is just like, yes, good job. Because you get this edge that is damn near mirror polish, but it is just absolutely sticky sharp. Um, I, I very, very much appreciate that. Considering how many makers send knives out with lackluster edges, Hogue is really doing good at that. And so having this great blade in this great steel that is coming sticky sharp, that's a beautiful freaking thing. Then finally, on the good side, the price on this guy is actually pretty solid given what you're getting here. It's 20 CV as a blade steel. It's a great design great machining, great build quality, um, and it's only 20 bucks more than the original and way more than 20 bucks nicer. You know what? Three years later worth of, uh, of change, yeah, this, this will do in terms of in terms of uh, price-wise. This is a pretty good value, I feel like. Sure, you can definitely get good knives cheaper than this, but for what you're getting here, I don't have any problem whatsoever with 160 bucks. They're, they're doing pretty good. So to me, all of that is the good, is that the price is, I think, a pretty good price. Um, it's got, it's super sharp with a great blade. It's fully ebidectic. The handles on this guy are amazing. I love this milling pattern so damn much, both aesthetically as well as in the hand. Um, they, they, they're working on the spring durability as an issue. I love seeing other designers working with Hogue as well, and I love seeing more products made in the States here. That's great. However, for me, the greatest part of this guy is the action. Hogue nailed this action, 100%. This able lock here um, seems to be lacking a lot of the issues that I've seen on other similar lock implementations from other companies. The action on this guy out of the box is basically perfect. It's exactly what I want an action to look like um, in this kind of a locking mechanism. It is absolutely beautifully drop shutty, um, and I'm running it actually a little tighter than I normally would just to kind of wear the uh, wear the bearing or the bearings, wear the washes in a little bit. It's running on phosphor bronze, by the way, um, but it absolutely drops shut. It you can do the flick open thing just by pulling back the lock, um, which is great. There is zero blade play, and it is perfectly scented. Um, this is exactly what I want this action to look like, and this is actually something that I've seen a couple of times now. I've made a point of actually going out and about 
out and handling a couple of different uh, knives from Hogue, not just in the, the, the Ritter Grip, uh, or I'm sorry, the Ritter uh, RSK Mark One. see, I'm uh, trying over here. Um, not just to see in that, but every one of these Able Locks I've handled has been just dead on in action. They have been nailing that. And that is a beautiful thing. If they're able to do these locks consistently and without any of those issues of centering or blade play or a, a binding action, mm, that's stellar. And so I want to see more of these guys made just so we have more of these locks that are just running exactly as they should be. Um, I, I hope that they continue that high standard because that's one of the things that's going to make their implementation of this seem way more interesting than some other approaches. So to me, what's great about this guy is that the action on this is exactly what I want from a lock like this. That is absolutely freaking great. This action was perfect. Um, on the bad side, I would like to see, so those springs that we were talking about earlier, the Omega Springs, those are something that in the past, and again, I've not had enough experience with this, have often felt a little bit consumable. They have a tendency to break, and so I would absolutely love to see a manufacturer just throw a couple of them in the package with the knife. I think that would be a great idea, because that way, if you have one break, you just take off that scale, you pop a new one in there, and problem solved. You're back at the races the next day. Hopefully, they're not going to break. Hopefully, they fix that issue, but it's a really nice show of good will. If those, even if those springs cost you 25 cents a pop or something like that, by God, just throw them in. Make, make it happen. For the price, I think you can still probably rock that. And it's just a nice little pat on the back. Just like, you know what? We're not going to have this problem, but just in case we do, here you go. I got you. And that's a nice thing. Next thing, this is a little tiny detail, and I suspect that this will change as I use this guy more, um, as I wear this guy in more, but there is a little tiny bit of roughness approximately here in the clothes, and you can actually see on the back of this guy little areas where it's sort of skating a little bit more. Um, it, it definitely, if you lube it up, that goes away for a little while, but I think it's just needing to wear down a little bit. Maybe there's a little bit of a rough patch in the, in the blade tang there, but again, not a big deal, but it's something to consider. Next thing, the balance on this guy is a little bit further back than I maybe like. Um, it's not terrible, but I'm finding the balances back here, and I'd like to see them do a little bit of milling on the inside of this guy. Um, the, the part, partly for the balance purpose, but partly actually because this guy is a little bit heavier than the Benchmade original version was. It's about three quarters of an ounce heavier. It's not a big deal, but it's not a super light knife. I mean, we are coming in here, I should actually just do the measurement here, for a blade that is... Doing the quick measurement here, we are coming in uncontroversially under three and a half inches, as you might expect from a company or from a guy who runs a organization. This is Doug Ritter of uh, of Knife Rights, by the way, the guy who's trying to get the knife legislation more reasonable. Um, but anyways, uh, it is. Uh, did I even look at the number there? I didn't even say the number. What the heck am I on about here? It's 4.63 ounces for about three and a half inches of blade. Um, you know, it's a little heavier, so I'd like to see them maybe mill out a little bit of that just to try and reduce that weight and get that balance a little bit more forward. Um, next thing, clip on this guy. The only hot spot on this, although the knife overall is pretty ergonomic, there is a small hot spot off the side of this clip here. That is the one disadvantage to going with a deep carry clip as they have here rather than a shallower carry. But the thing is, this looks like a relatively common clip pattern, so it could be that you could swap that clip into another uh, that would uh, carry a little bit more, uh, that, that would put that little lump a little bit further down this way and prevent that one little hot spot. Again, it's not bad, but it's the one hot spot I'm noticing on here. And finally, on the bad side, um, this little knife is a little bit on the thick side. Let me pull out my caliper real quick, and I'll just try and get a quick measurement of that. Even putting the uh, clip aside here, we are coming in at uh, 16 point, oh, millimeters. Well, okay, there you go, 16 millimeters or uh, 0.65 inches thick, and that's probably about the thickest area. Maybe it's a little thicker down here. Either way, um, we are not, it's not a thin knife whatsoever, and that's something to consider. Um, if you are looking for something that is thin above all else, this is not going to be the best thing in the pocket. This guy comes in thicker than the PM2, even just in terms of the G10. It, you definitely feel this guy in the pocket in that dimension. And so, to me at least, all of that is the bad. This is a relatively thick knife. Um, it, the clip is a bit of a hot spot. It's a little heavier than the original, and the balance is a little further back. There's a little roughness on the clothes, although I suspect that will wear in over time. And I'd really love to see them include an extra spring or two in the package, because again, they're in the process of launching new knives with this, and that would be a great tradition to start. However, I don't think that's going to happen because of the ugly issue here. The only ugly issue is not a problem with this particular knife, but a problem that Hogue has been, uh, well, having for a while now, which is that Hogue's warranty policy plainly states that disassembling this knife voids the warranty. I am, now, don't get me wrong. I'm completely okay with a maker saying something along the lines of, if you take the knife apart and you screw it up, 
We are not going to fix that for free. If you take the knife apart and you can't get it back together and you mail it to them as a baggie of sharp parts, then you deserve every bit of charge coming to you. But saying uh, what their warranty says right now is if you take active steps to maintain your tools, that this is not verbatim, but this is, you know, basically what it means, um, we will wash our hands of you. If you have taken your knife apart, your warranty is void. That, to me, is really, really ugly. These are tools. They're tools that you need to be able to maintain. They're tools you need to be able to take care of. And saying, you know what? If you take care of your tools, we are done with you. Adios, amigo. That sucks. Um, and in fact, it's way behind almost every major knife maker at this point in time. And several knife makers have changed their policies to be something a little bit more permissive along the lines of, you know, if you, we don't mind if you take your knives apart. If you screw it up or you do so, that's on you. But that's not a good policy. So Hogue needs to rethink that policy because I think, honestly, that's Hogue's biggest issue as a brand right now. Everything else is freaking roses and unicorns. Um, if they fix that issue, it's just like, yeah, I'm a Hogue fanboy. Um, and so they but they definitely need to work on fixing that as so many other makers have in the past. And that's ugly. So um, they just need to fix the warranty. On the uh, on the bad side, no, we did that already. On the final conclusion front, um, look, I actually like the first generation Rita Grip a fair amount. Um, it's a, a, a very nice Rita Grip. I'm sorry, um, Mark, uh, RSK Mark 1. Um, it is a great shape um, for the blade. This is a good blade. It's a nice design. It's a solid idea. Frankly, it was a damn nice tool. But it had some issues. I mean, it too was a bit of a thick boy. It, uh, it had a little bit of plasticky feeling. I did not care for the, the plastic griptilian approach, really, ever. Um, and I didn't love the inconsistency that seemed to plague the, those particular knives. This version fixes almost all of that. It's still a thick knife, but at some level, you know, hey, why not? If you're down with the thickness, enjoy. Um, but it has gone from being so-so uh, plastic to a beautifully milled G10 um, that is absolutely griptacular. It's, it's just great. And the action that I've handled on every one of these damn things from Hogue has been dead on. On. Even other models from from them, uh, other access, or I'm sorry, other accessible locks. I'm sorry, able locks. Um, they have all been good to go, and the end result of this is pretty damn great. It's U.S. made, ergonomic, nicely milled, ambidextrous with beautiful blade on here at a pretty damn solid price. And there's not really that much wrong with it either. It's a little heavier than the old one. It's the clip's a bit of a hot spot. It's a little thick in the pocket. And the warranty policy needs some refinement as they work to expand in the knife market. But look, all of that aside, this feels like a gem to me. It is a relatively simple tool. If you are looking for something that is amazingly flashy, this is not going to be it. This is not going to be something I suspect that appeals to the same people that, uh, well, are doing things like this on a regular basis. This is the Lamech Busker. But um, nevertheless, um, it's not going to be the pocket jewelry sort of thing. This is a relatively simple tool. It is a boring tool, but as many of you may know, I consider boring to be a very high compliment for a tool. It's something that you put in your pocket, you use it when it, you, you take it out, you use it when you need it, you put it back in, you don't think Think about it again because it just freaking works and every time that i carried this it was delightfully boring and that is a great thing so it's a, a nice tool it's done very well and i can definitely see a lot of people loving this guy personally i this is a little bigger than i'd like to carry on a regular basis so i'm really hoping there is a mini version of this guy in the works because if hogan ritter can do this on at, at full size the mini one should be really compelling for me with my particular things and mind you of course there, there are other other good choices out there for pocket knives you got the Spyderco uh, PM2 here, which is uh, a little bit cheaper than this guy, but is still a, a very, very good everyday carry knife. You've got the uh, Spyderco Shaman. This is an S90 version, a little pricier, um, and, but the Shaman generally is pricier. And it is a little bit more ergonomic than, the, uh, the, the, than this little guy right here. And of course, um, you can still get a, a Griptilian knife from Benchmade. They're still making those, and they even have a version that's in G10 and 20 CV. But this honestly feels a little bit better, and it is way cheaper than the 20 CV version. So, yeah, that's... Uh uh, yeah. Um, so finally, I think this is just a really nice choice. And I can see a lot of people loving this knife. And I can definitely see why, uh, well, he's been making these for so damn long and why so many people have kept buying him. So this is a very, very nice knife. It is beautifully made. This is a gem 100%. Good job, Hogue. Well done getting this able lock working beautifully. Good job, Doug. But you've been doing it for a long time anyways. And uh, it's definitely time for a mini. So um, there you go. Hope this has been interesting to you and that you have yourselves just an absolutely wonderful rest of your day. Bye now.